Okay, so what I read was of Mice and Men, written by an, uh, an author named John Steinbeck, and it was published in 1937. The genre is historical fiction. I'll start off with a summary. So, Lenny is a tall, a very tall man who's very, uh, how do you say, um, dumb. He has a mental illness, basically, and... Uh, he worked. Uh, he he's best friends with uh, another man named George, and uh, ba and he is basically the smart guy or the one who looks out for Lenny. And so Lenny and George are on their way to the farm of their for their new jobs. While they were headed to the farm, George starts to tell Lenny the dream of where to just be him and Lenny working and doing their own things without no one telling them to do anything. It was basically an endless dream where two best friends had. Uh, it was an endless dream two best friends could ever had. After arriving and getting the job, they meet Candy, who is an old man and owns an old dog that was very close to him. Because the dog was becoming old, dirty, and useless, all the workers decide and try to convince Candy to kill the dog. The dog ends up being killed, leaving Candy mortified. Later on, Candy hears George and Lenny conversing about their dream, and Candy offered that if he can come, he will give them his life savings. They agreed, and Candy, and now Candy was part of the dream. Curly, the farm owner's son, had a very flirtatious wife, who always bothered the workers, Two of them being George and Lenny. Now, because of recent events in the past, George warns Lenny that if Lenny ended up causing trouble while they were working at the farm, Lenny would then have to go back to the river far away from the farm. Throughout the rest of the book, Lenny talks to Crooks, a lonely black man. Lenny gets a puppy he's always wanted, Curly's wife is still being flirty around the workers, and Curly himself ends up fighting Lenny because he accused Lenny of doing something with his wife. In the last few chunks of the book, Lenny and Curly's wife ends up talking to each other where Curly's wife admits that she has a boring life while Lenny says he loves soft things. Because, because her hair was soft, Curly's wife offers him to touch her hair. However, Lenny had grabbed onto it tightly, frightening Curly's wife. Lenny had remembered what George said and proceeded to try to calm her down, but because of his strength, he had instead, by mistake, broke her neck and killed her. Remembering what George had said, Lenny had... <clears throat> Oh shit. Lenny had, had ran far away from the far, farm to the pool. The workers are alerted and George and the rest of, the rest of them went out to look and find Lenny. George had, found, eh, George had found Lenny at the pool where he told him to go. To Lenny's surprise, George wasn't angry and George instead started talking about the dream again where Lenny and George could do whatever they want. As Lenny was smiling and listening to the story, he was also unaware of what George was about to do. George had pulled out the gun and shot Lenny in the head. <laughs> The workers find find George where he li the workers found George where he lies and tells them that Lenny had the gun and ended up taking the gun away and shooting Lenny. George then leaves his lifeless friends behind as the other workers watch him walk away. And that's the summary. So <clears throat> two schools of criticism I'm gonna be looking at is psychoanalytical and structuralism and semiotics. So let's start off with psychoanalytical. First question, what might a given interpretation of a literary work suggest about the psychological, eh, psychological motives of the reader? In other words, what can this book suggest about my psychological motives? Well, I, I didn't, when I chose this book, I didn't think I was going to say, hey, let's read Love My Sin Men. No, I just read it because it was a Penguin classic, and I like books that somehow gives a meaning or teaching, kind of like To Kill a Mockingbird or The Blue Side, something like that. And, um... One quote that, you know, one quote that um, really um, took me by surprise was, The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steady. This was, uh, and it's on page 104. This was when um, George was about to kill Lenny. Now, he, he was, like, nervous that he, he had to do it, but he was, you know, very determined at the same time. Another quote was that George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him. Again, page 104, but... This, that uh, that was the whole scene where George had ended up killing his best friend Lenny and ended up, you know, being very um, regretful about it. But he knew he had to do it. He was he didn't like it. Now, that I feel like... To, now, how does that suggest about my psychological motives? Well, I believe that, you know, it teaches you something. Stuff like these things in life, they always, you know, there's always a meaning behind... Meaning behind Things like these, whether it's losing your friend, losing your parents, or, you know, a massacre, or some, something, you know, traumatic. In this case, what tra traumatized George a little bit was killing his own friend. And George must feel like hell. Next question. 
What trials or ordeals does the protagonist face? What is the reward for overcoming them? Well, I feel like the trial or ordeals that George, the really main protagonist, and Lenny, who's the other protagonist, George had to face basically a journey of where he had to kill his best friend, Lenny. Now, when he killed Lenny, he didn't do it in a remorseful way, no. And he, But when he killed him, I didn't feel like he got a reward, but Lenny does. You know, think of them as one protagonist, not two different protagonists. And why I say this? Because in the beginning, around, no, around the middle, where Curly, the old man, he had a dog who was very dear to him. Think of George as Curly and think of Lenny as the dog. Lenny's not a dog, though. But basically, a shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man on page 49. And that meant a lot to Curly because his dog was his whole world. And Curly didn't actually kill his own dog. No, no, not Curly, not Curly. Oh, crap. I meant Curly is actually Kenny. Ugh, Candy. Uh, Candy didn't kill his dog. Um, Carlson did. One of the workers did for him. And he later on said that, you know, it should have been me who should have killed my dog. And in a way, that was kind of like sending a message to George that, hey, you should kill your friend. <sighs> and then um, the other quote is that Lenny begged, let's do it now. Let's get that place now on page 103, moments before he gets shot in the head. Now, um, what was the question? Um, the reward was that um, Lenny, um, basically for George, he, base, uh, he had to like learn something. But I think the real reward was that Lenny got to be, I guess, free. Because, you know, he seemed really determined. Because George was, you know, Lenny loved the dream. And George was telling him again and again. So when George was about to kill him, he wanted Lenny to die happy. That's why he said, let's do this dream. Let's go live off the fada, the land. Oh, and you can pet the rabbits and all this. And that's why Lenny was smiling. He was happy. It was very sad. But George had had to do what he had to do. And he ended up shooting Lenny in the head, which wasn't very fun. All right, and that's psychoanalytical um, school criticism. The next one, was, as I mentioned before, was structuralism and semiotics. Third question, what patterns exist within the text that connects it to the larger human experience? In other words, can we connect patterns and elements within the text to other texts from other cultures to map similarities that tell us more about the common human experience? This is basically a liberal humanist move that assumes that since we're all human, we all share the basic human commonalities. I don't really, I kind of believe in that, but I feel like, yes, humans all do share something. Kind of like, you know, we're all crazy. And um, one thing I believe that humans usually have is a trait where we avoid, we try to avoid our fears and, and or problems. And examples of that is um, patterns that show that um, are shown in like the books like The Blue Sky and The Alchemist, you know. They, in Cola and The Blue Sky, she tried to get her dream. Her dream was having these blue eyes. She was black, but it was ba basically impossible to get these blue eyes. And that's why, you know, it's a dream that sometimes you can't get. And we all strive for dreams, you know, humans. And then The Alchemist, Santiago, he wanted to like find who he was or find his true meaning. And I don't really remember the book, honestly, but... He um, basically went on this long journey where, in reality, he didn't have to go all that far and off just to realize that, hey, he'll just do what he loves, go marry Fatima, and um, live with, no, um, and her she, um, take care of sheep. But, back to Of Mice and Men, one of the quotes that I thought was, that was really helpful was the dream, such as, with us, it ain't like that. We got a dream. And Lenny says, and live off the father of the land, on page 15. And I thought that was, um, you know, as I said before, uh, uh, that's what I see in this quote that's connected to the blue, the bluest eye and the alchemist. They all have this dream and we all just want to, you know, do something with our lives, something meaningful. Like for me personally, like maybe I could go to college or I don't know, live in an apartment or have a family. Just an example. We all have our dreams, right? Fourth question, what rules or codes of interpretation must be internalized in order to make sense of the text? Or, in other words, how should you interpret in order to understand the text? Now, I kind of thought of this about, like, morals or something like that, but it's, be, 
as I said before, was basically saying is that what should you know by heart already or in your life in order to understand the book of Mice and Men? I thought that you had to understand friendship because George and Lenny are best friends and they've been friends since they were basically um, teens or kids and they've been taking care of each other. Well, George mainly takes care of Lenny, but as long as that goes, they ended up just being a very good friends and uh, hmm, a quote yeah I'm gonna use a um, candy's quote um, a shot sound into this said the man look quickly at the old man I'm using that quote again and the other quote that I used again the hand shook violently but his face set and his hand steady and um, basically I thought that as I said before well, I didn't really mention it before but um, <clears throat> uh, think I thought that Candy's dog dying and Lenny dying was, you know, there was supposed to be some of that. I'm not saying Lenny's a dog, like I mentioned before, but that, you know, it's kind of like, not a symbol, but a meaning that, you know, if it should be you, because you know that person, why, you know, you have to let him go. If not, then you would feel nothing but pain. And I think that's what Candy felt, because after Candy, uh, okay, after, ugh, after his dog had died, he was, you know, mortified. He didn't like. He didn't like it. He didn't like what Carlson did. You know, he was very sad. He was. He was a little bit disappointed. And then he tells. Actually, he actually tells George like it should have been me, George. And then George like yes, I understand. But at the end, I think that's what George got out of that. I think maybe Candy's, you know, conversation with him had influenced George to do that. That's why George had killed Lenny. Because he knew that he didn't want to be like Candy, all, you know, sad and wary of it. But he was, regardless, because they were very close friends. So George kills Lenny, and it's very sad. Um, what else? Oh, final reflection. Now, uh, basically, uh, which school of criticism is more useful in interpreting this book? Or if one works better than the other, well, then why? Why would they work equally? Well... Why? Well, I thought that they both work equally because in psychoanalytical um, analysis, I thought that, you know, we got to we gotta understand humans, kind of like in structural and semiotics. We got to understand the pattern. Sorry. We got to understand the pattern within humans. You know, this book, you can kind of identify human behavior, kind of like how, you know, candy lost a dog, George lost Lenny, and you can kind of see how Curly's love of being flirtatious, you know, and it's like analytical, you know, if I were in, in George's, um, George's position, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it, because it's my best friend, you know, and, uh, a sh it's some it's stuff like that that we have to learn sometimes, and that's what we end up doing, and how they work together, the two, um, schools of criticism, I kind of feel like they, they 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 can't work without each other because you need to for like structure and semiotics. I think it's good that you need to know like your morals or you know the human pattern again, how to understand the text. In a psychoanalytical, how does you know how do how do humans behave? How what does the protagonist face? Well, you know, and what does it say about the reader? Why do I want to read this? You know. It's questions like that that I feel like are very necessary for this type of book because it's only two, the story really only takes two days. Like in the movie um, with Gary Sinus and John Malkovich, it was literally a two day process and all that happened. So much has happened in only two days and you know, you're just left with, wow, Lenny's dead. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.